We have Sean Veal, who, as you can see, is with us, uh, assistant professor at the American University of Paris and a senior lecturer in international law and associate researcher at Sciences Po. So Sean's particular field of interest, I can see from the blurb to the book, is the relationship between international and domestic law, the politics of international law and the role of courts, about, about which she has published much. So her postdoc research was on the Guantanamo Bay military commissions and was conducted at Berkeley. Before that, Sharon was involved in a research project on security and transition led by Mary Caldor at the LSC and was a research fellow at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian and Human Rights Law for several years. So an awful lot of experience to draw on and um, worked on this particular project for a great amount of time as well, together with two others who, who aren't with us, but I know Sharon will mention and credit in due course. So yeah. Sharon, thanks very much indeed for giving us a bit of your time to hear about this. Over to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so I will share my screen if this is all right, because I have a kind of presentation. So I don't know the people who listen to us if they are only on audio, but uh, there is kind of interest also to sometimes look at the presentation because uh, I, I made uh, uh, some picture. I, I put some picture there as well, but of course anyone uh, uh, is free to do as, as he or she wants. So thank you so much for, for this occasion to present the book. So I know we, we discussed this with Fionola so long ago, it was in 2020, but with the COVID it takes time, voila. So uh, finally uh, we arrived. So here is the book. Uh, and as you said, I co-edited with uh, Kim Sillinger and Tristan Carlston. Uh, so we are three editors uh, uh, for this book. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, voila. Can you tell me if it's OK? Do you see it? Yeah. Yep, showing now. Good, so let me, OK. <laughs> so I put you here. Uh, <laughs> maybe I can put. Uh, wait, just a second. Sorry for this. I maybe I will put uh, how you make the gallery so we can you can still see me somehow when I'm speaking. Uh, gallery. Do you know where is the gallery? Not too sure. We can still uh -huh. see you whenever you're on your PowerPoint. Uh, okay, you can still see me. Okay, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, if it's only the PowerPoint. Uh, Perhaps it's well. Yeah. Okay, so it's okay like this. Can I go? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so um, today, so I, I would like to present you the book uh, uh, and also the follow-up article that we've just published that I, I sent you by uh, by email. And indeed, the idea will be. Uh, to look a little bit at, at the trial, uh, this is, uh, I will start with for the ones who are not familiar with the Habre trial, but then mainly uh, I will focus on the structure on the book and the method uh, we've used. Uh, and just to, to reassure the, the PhD students, if some of the, uh, you are listening to me, uh, you know, uh, with the method, it's not necessarily that at the beginning of the project, we have a very clear idea of, of what we are going to do. And I think that when you are doing empirical studies with uh, meaning uh, going to the field, collecting the material and, and doing uh, uh, the, really the field research and then the theory uh, arises from what you have collected. So not having a clear um, you know, a clear goal, a clear idea uh, is also fine. And I really encourage people uh, to go to go where the law is being made uh, and then uh, the idea will, will follow. And uh, especially during this COVID period that so many of us are be behind the desk uh, and the computer, uh, I think it's even more important to really go to the places, to open the door, to meet people, to discuss, uh, and from the collection of the material, uh, then um, to establish the theory. So this is more or less uh, what we did here. 
And this is in addition to other uh, courts that I've studied. Uh, now I'm studying the terror courts in Paris. So we are following now the Bataclan trial. Uh, I did before military courts, whether in Israel or in Guantanamo. Uh, so uh, uh, the Habre trial. So I have already quite a large uh, uh, experience in examining court and also the asylum court. We will start a project with asylum court uh, in September. So uh, at the end, uh, I will uh, identify those general uh, theoretical um, steam for research that uh, we've developed from this research, but also from other researchers. Voila, so just to, to start with Habre, and really I'm not going to go into it too much. Uh, uh, probably some of you know already, and if not, uh, you can uh, look for this information. So uh, uh, Habre was the, the president of Chad, and he was in power, you can see here, between uh, 82 until uh, there was the coup d'etat. And uh, during his, the, the period of uh, his reign, uh, there were um, very severe technique uh, in order to oppress opposition groups, uh, including torture, including prison, imprisonment, uh, uh, killings, etc. So uh, this was uh, during this year. Now, I, um, again, I'm not going to speak too much in detail about the acts because this is uh, not uh, what... Uh, uh, we are looking here, but maybe it's interesting to, to look at the times uh, and to keep this uh, in mind. So, uh, in the 90s, after uh, he was thrown out from his regime, he goes to Senegal, uh, where he is uh, he's, uh, hosted, let's say, by the government, and uh, is there, and he lives his life uh, in Senegal. Uh, so what happened in Chad is that in 92, we will start to have the first Truth Commission to investigate what happened there uh, under the President Deby, who uh, passed away not long time ago. And then in 1998, uh, we have the first idea to start to think of having uh, accountability for the crime uh, made by Habre, uh, inspired by the case of the Pinochet that was also brought by uh, uh, Reed Brody of Human Rights Watch uh, in Spain and then in the UK. Uh, so the idea was really, uh, this is what we were told uh, by Reed Brody many times, that he's sitting one day in his office, there is a knock on his door, and there is this uh, Chadian uh, lawyer uh, that they already organized the victim there and they are seeking for accountability and they ask to have uh, a collaboration with Human Rights Watch in order to, to bring um, the, the former president to, to trial. So what we will see is from then, from this moment, you see from 2000, from year 2000, when they filed their first complaint in Senegal uh, until uh, the trial started in 2016, so you, you can see it's 16 years, but actually that it started even before. We have many legal entities that were involved, so we put them here uh, um, on the map uh, in order to see uh, what different uh, entity uh, on a global scale uh, were involved with. Uh, so you have local court uh, in Senegal, you will have local court in Belgium, you will have international court, including the ICJ, you will have the United uh, Nation uh, CAT Committee, you will have the African Union getting involved. Okay, so you have a whole range of, of collaboration and attempt uh, to bring justice until the decision um, in 2013 to establish this uh, hybrid court, the, the Extraordinary African Chambers, that will be situated within the Dakar, um, the Dakar judiciary. Uh, so indeed, it is a hybrid court because you had uh, foreign financement, you will have uh, um, a special statute that we will draft uh, in order to prosecute uh, uh, and and you will have some international stuff, 
But on the other hand, the rule of procedure is completely Senegalese. You have many staff within the, the Senegalese uh, of the uh, Senegalese uh, judiciary. So yes, it is hybrid, but with a very strong local component uh, of Senegal. And then on 2016, uh, there is the first instance that uh, imposed life imprisonment on Habre, and 2017, which is uh, affirmed by an appeal. And as you perhaps know, uh, Habre died a few months ago from COVID in prison. Uh, but this is to say that uh, he was in prison uh, until a few months ago and, you know, he did not get any pardon or, or whatever. Uh, so what are the elements of success of this trial? So we can see a very low budget in 10 million uh, 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 dollar, which is very low uh, comparing to the ICC or other courts. Uh, you have the court that did it uh, from 2013 and 17. Uh, so it was also a, a very fast trial if we think about the, the terms of the ICC. Uh, there was no big fraud, no, no irregularity. You know, it functioned. It started and it ended within the budget and within the time, fra the time frame. We did not, not have any witness or lawyer that were killed or disappeared. Uh, in this sense, uh, the, the trial started and ended uh, successfully. Uh, the second uh, important thing, and I think that when we were there, we could really uh, hear uh, about this everywhere, is that the, the, this judgment the, was produced by an African court. So you have this slogan, you know, that was all, all the time said, African, uh, uh, African court that deliver an African justice for African um, uh, what, uh, uh, criminals and that you don't need that this external uh, entity. So in this sense, uh, uh, the, the African lawyers and member of the judiciary really attributed to themselves uh, this justice and were very proud of it. Then we can see that there are also very good uh, lessons that we can learn from it, uh, also for the, the ICC. So uh, there was a strong reliance of local magistrate, as I said, of local knowledge, uh, uh, which was very efficient and, uh, you know, in, in the same level as we could see in any other place. Uh, and perhaps the most important lesson that we should have from this case is the question of the participation of the victims. We have a very strong participation of the victim. It was, in fact, a bit like a truth commission. Uh, and uh, it was very, very empowering uh, to see all these victims coming to chat, giving testimonies uh, when... Uh, uh, being in court. Many, many victims. We had 8,000 victims. They were a group in three groups. Uh, I could discuss more about the question of civil participation, but what was interesting is to see that it really functioned, and uh, um, this could be an important lesson for the ICC. So because it was a civil law country that used civil law procedure, um, uh, you know, it's always the question in the ICC whether it's common law and civil law. And I think this idea of civil law country to have parti civil, to have the victim really participate in the proceeding and not only as, uh, as um, te témoin is very, very important. Uh, voilà. So again, we can go back to the, to the discussion because I think this is uh, very important and we see this today also in the Bataclan trial, how important the role of the victim is and justice is for the victim. And I really believe that the platform of the court uh, should not be only for the accused and only uh, to find uh, the, the guiltiness of an accused, but this is also a platform of uh, for the victim for a process of, tra of of transitional justice we can say in the sense where victim can see justice seeks the truth and have a process of healing uh, so i think that having this within the court is very interesting so we saw it there we can see it today in colombia we see it uh, in uh, in france in the bataclan it's all those tribunals that are based on the civil law uh, tradition, which is uh, 
putting a very important place to victim. Voilà. Uh, then another interesting thing was the uh, the, 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 the collaboration, you know, between local lawyers and international lawyers, local NGO, international NGOs, uh, professionals, and uh, uh, etc. So we could think, you know, like post uh, post colonial theory and, 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 and you know, the, the, the control of the West on the um, on Africa in what is a criminal law order, etc. But here we can really we could really see a horizontal relation and uh, it's not necessarily that the international player were more strong than the national player uh, so in this sense it was really really uh, interesting and uh, we could go back to this again then the element of failure so you know they could be more but just to uh, quickly so only we had the habre that was tried uh, and not other uh, five uh, people that were identified because, of course, they are also somehow involved in the the, the government at that time uh, with the B. So it was so you know the collaboration with Chad was good, uh, but at the beginning, even Chad they contribute uh, one million dollar, I think, or three million. I don't remember, but they were an important donor of this court in Chad. Uh, but uh, as the investigation advances, as, as the investigating judges came to judge uh, to Chad in order to do the investigation and wanted, uh, you know, to to touch uh, in other direction than in Habre, then the, uh, started to be more tension, and at the end uh, the collaboration stopped. And and uh, and the the people from from Dakar or from the extraordinary chamber uh, could not attend. I mean, they ask uh, a restaurant, and they issue a restaurant, but no one was extradited. Uh, beside the abre that was there already in Senegal. Uh, second thing is perhaps uh, that uh, we don't know anything new about Chad and the violence and, and, and the cause uh, and also about the number of victims and many other things. Uh, in a way, um, you know, from a historical point of view, maybe the contribution of the decision is a bit limited, but then it depends what we expect also from uh, from a decision. Uh, again, it was also hard because you had only Habre uh, that was accused. Of course, there's nothing about, you know, French and the US who supported him during so long uh, when he was in place because he was fighting the front uh, against Libya. Uh, so in a way, you know, always those uh, decisions are a bit out of a more uh, ge geopolitical context. Uh, so this is also the case in this case. And lastly, maybe the thing that is the most important for the victim is that uh, they uh, were awarded reparation, but it never uh, they never got the money. And the the the, the hard question is who is going to pay it. And um, I think this question is not, um, I, I did not do any follow-up in the recent couple of years, but I don't think there is any advancement uh, on this question of reparation. Voila, so this was about uh, the trial in itself. So now uh, to share with you a little bit our experience. So here I put some photos. Uh, so uh, our collaboration was me uh, with my colleague um, with my colleague in Berkeley. Uh, so here is Shastin, so we cannot really see in the photo. Uh, and here is Kim. Uh, so we decided uh, to start working uh, on this project. And um, uh, it was really a work that we started with our students. So we went to Dakar several times with students. So with students from Sciences Po, and here we had a workshop uh, before going there. So we had invited many people who were actually uh, actors in this case, because many of them are in France. Uh, so we made this workshop and then we went uh, to, to Dakar and we did a lot, a lot of interview. So our idea was to, to interview a very right, uh, wide range of actors. So it's not only the judge and the defense lawyer, but it will be also journalists, it will be also the Bar Association, it will be uh, um, many NGOs, so it will be secretaries, it will be not necessarily administrators, uh, you know, so it's not necessarily only the most important people, but the idea is 
to 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 meet a very uh, wide range of, of actor and this is a little bit what we will have a, at the end of the book and uh, this is what i'm calling uh, the orchestra approach so you know in order to produce music uh, it's not only the chef d'orchestre uh, that uh, is the responsible for the music but uh, each one of the player in the orchestra is important. Uh, so similarly, in order to produce uh, a core decision, it's not only the judge. The judge is maybe the last uh, one, uh, the last, um, uh, the, the one that arrive at, at, at the last stage. But uh, we have many, many actors uh, that are responsible for the production of this uh, a judicial decision and this is something that sometimes we forget when we are in law school because at law school uh, if you are in law schools uh, law students uh, i don't know how many are listening are sociologists political scientists or, or law students but when you are a law student you usually really study the the decision and maybe even the one paragraph that is of interest of your professor and, and you don't necessarily see the entire uh, human, um, uh, you know, human uh, production of it, the the the, the human enterprise and and the, the actors that are behind and the, uh, um, and and the different interests that are, are, are behind. Uh, voilà. So this is uh, really what was important for us. So we went there. We met so many people, and it was so interesting. And then we were asking ourselves, OK, what are we going to do now with all those interviews that our students transcript very well? And uh, uh, we had really a serious material. Uh, so of course, we had the, the opportunity to just write a book, right? So uh, perhaps this was the easy way to do. <laughs> but uh, uh, we didn't choose to do this uh, in this way. And what we wanted to do is actually to bring all those voices, uh, uh, let's say, as directly as we could uh, for the reader. So what we did is the first part of this book, which is 26 chapter, uh, is the part that we call the trial told by its actors, meaning that we have uh, asked many different actors to contribute to the book. Most of them agrees and agreed. And like this, we established the entire story from the 80s until the appeal and even beyond uh, through the stories uh, of the real actors. Uh, so we divided it to four sections, the early attempts between 82 to 2012. So here you will have the Truth Commission and you will have the universal jurisdiction cases in Senegal and, and the investigation in Belgium. So we will have here, you know, a defense lawyer and you will have the, the president of the Truth Commission and, uh, you know, all the people, um, seven people I think that contributed in this part. Then in the second part, it will be about establishing the court. So you, we have a contribution from Ben Kiko from the African Union, how they got this decision to establish the court. And uh, um, then we will have uh, the trial and beyond the courtroom. So we will have the prosecutor, the defense lawyer, the, the judges, the appeal judges, but we have also donors, we have also administrators, we have journalists, we have the academia that were involved in training uh, from Canada. Uh, voilà. So um, here in the photo, you can see the uh, the archive. So this is uh, Human Rights Watch. This is the first chapter in the book. This is uh, Olivier Berco from Human Rights Watch. He's describing how they found by ch by hasard, by chance, they found this huge archive and how they took, how they did the photocopies, how they uh, really, you know, took it to New York in a bit illegally uh, in order to 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 keep the information. Um, here, this is Jacqueline Mundina. So this is the first Chadian lawyer uh, ever, uh, the, the first woman to ha to be a lawyer. And she tells her story, how she organized the victims and how she represented the victim in court. Uh, uh, this is another chapter. Here is a chapter of the investigative judge. So he's telling us how he's going to Chad and, and doing the 
the, the investigation and the problem of collaboration and deception, etc. Here, those are trials that took in parallel in uh, Chad in a way also to prevent the arrest of, uh, of the others to the extraordinary chamber. So we have also a chapter speaking about this. And here in this picture, so you can see this is the prosecutor. You have read Brady from Human Rights Watch. This was the defense lawyer. So just uh, if I can go back here, the defense lawyer, these were the defense lawyer of Habre. They were appointed lawyer by Habre. And here he's here also. So we spent an entire day with him with the interview. And it was really a, a fantastic interview. Um, this was one of the... Uh, lawyers of Abre, but not the appointed lawyer, because he has his private lawyer, but they refuse to cooperate with the court, uh, and those were the appointed lawyer. Uh, voilà. So, and here this is a journalist that she's telling us how she was reporting uh, this affair in Senegal uh, for the Senegalese public. Uh, voilà. So, in, in a way, this is our new methodology, uh, our new contribution let's say, to study. So we are really giving to the reader um, empirical account, and we really hope that with this empirical account, other research could be possible, because of course, not everybody can go and spend so many time doing interview as we did. So in this way, we bring you this material directly from the author through their own narrative. It's just short chapters of five, um, of five pages. And actually, in my classes, what I'm doing, I'm giving every uh, every two, three students to present a chapter. And slowly, slowly like this, we do a kind of a mood court because then you have the, all the participants uh, uh, that uh, that are there. So actually, it's also very useful for students and for teachers uh, who are teaching uh, international criminal law uh, in this way, because it really gives insight from within. Uh, so this was the first part, and then we had another part of 18 chapters, so you can imagine the ones who, who edited chapters, how is it to edit like uh, so many chapters, I think we have 43 chapters, if I'm not wrong, so um, here, uh, these are academic contributions, so you have, uh, you know, very, you have very renowned uh, professor like Richard Goldstone and Bill Shabas, along with uh, uh, other, yeah, there is Eric Stover from Berkeley and uh, other from uh, uh, experts we have also, or PhD students, so also a kind of a range of author from different countries, from Europe, from Africa, from the US, uh, uh, different perspective, and then we try to put them also according uh, to a kind of a socio-legal analyze of the academic position. So um, some of them are under the first uh, part, which is portrait, positionality, and parading. Those are people who are more uh, uh, looking at the DICL from, you know, a, a more... Um, they take a step back and they establish paradigm. Uh, the second part will be more about norm, the, the institution and the pillars. Uh, the third about the actor and the dynamic of the actor. And lastly, about the politics and the interaction. Voila, so this is the, the, the last uh, chapter, the, the last uh, part of the book. Now I would like to finish, uh, and then we can discuss if you have questions. I would like to finish by the theoretical uh, framework that we've been developing since uh, based on empirical findings. So as I said at the beginning, the idea really is to go to the field and to do empirical empirics. So here in this case, we did some observation, but only on the appeal because we arrived a bit, uh, we arrived between the trial and the appeal. So we did not follow the trial itself, but we did many interviews. Uh, for example, now in Paris, I'm following every day almost the, the trial in the Bataclan. So we are really watching uh, the, the, in the audience, um, in, the, in the courtroom. Uh, voilà, but whatever the idea is, whatever the, the empirical finding that, uh, that you have, and then uh, you develop the theory, and this is what we call grounded theory. Um, so uh, the, the, the theoretical approach that we propose for the studying of court is based on four uh, axes of law, of the sociology of the actor, the institutional factors, and the interaction of the politic. 
so the first one is uh, to see the dynamic of the legal doctrine and how law faces international crime. Of course, it could be how it, it faces terrorism, how it faces uh, uh, sexual violence, whatever you are interested to look at. And um, uh, what we propose here to, to see is how political and so social goals are translated into legal doctrine and how when once we have the doctrine that function as an independent force because law is also independent because we all believe in a way or another, especially its actor, believe that it's an independent force. Uh, so then it's interesting to see how this doctrine facilitate this achievement of the original political goal, or perhaps it limits this um, uh, through interpretation or fact finding. Well, so uh, this is to see how legal doctrine are, are being, uh, 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 how they are born and how they are being applied. And in our own um, example, it could be to see sexual violence and how the doctrine of sexual violence entered into the, the court decision. And, and we have an entire chapter on this and also in the, in the chapter on, of the RCRC, uh, there is a discussion on this in the article. And then the second acts uh, that we propose uh, for research to look at is the role of the human actor law at work. So it's it, it's as opposition to law in the books. Uh, so we have what is doctrine, what is theoretical to say, you know, the precedent, this, this, and the other precedent, this, this, and this court, this, this. Okay, this is how we study in law. But it's also interesting to see how the law is really being produced uh, because it's not like something that judge apply like a, as a divine power, you know. <laughs> uh, so what we say again is the court decision is a product of many actors. And what is interesting to look at is both at the trajectory of the actor, so their bios, who they where, where they come from, where did they study, what allegiance do they have, so this is one thing. And the second thing is about their interaction. Uh, so we are interested in the judicial actors background, relation, hierarchy and power dynamic within their own professional, uh, judicial professional and field uh, in order to see what impact these have on the judicial decision and also to see whether there are competitions. So for example, we could see in the Habre, there was a competition, for example, uh, between the donors and the local administrator and the local administrator were very very strong you know with a strong character so we could see that he made a lot of influence uh, in this in this is in the sense then we can think about international and national collaboration that went well actually because many also were from a civil law background so if you have the the Belgium investigative judge uh, that cooperate with the investigating judges of the court, uh, the cooperation of the NGO with horizontal. So this was, um, but on the other hand, you have also the uh, always saying, you know, yes, it's African justice by African actors. Uh, but then when we speak with the, the, the defense lawyer, uh, he was saying to us, yeah, you know, uh, but if you read uh, the decision, you will see that it's written uh, springtime in Chad, like, the, you know, the, they, they start to say the uh, when it was springtime in Chad. And he told me this cannot be written by an African because in Africa you don't have spring, you have the raining season or the non raining season. So this was for obvious for the defense lawyer that it was a European that wrote the decision. And then indeed, when we dig the in, so we found out that the French judge uh, wrote the decision that was paid by uh, Switzerland. Uh, so this is uh, was also interesting. And this, of course, you can know only if you start, you know, to, to question and to observe who are the actor. Then the third axis is institutional factor, hierarchy, uh, bureaucracy and performance. Uh, so we we observe that the legal work is impacted by the structure of the institution, including the routine, the legal bureaucracy and efficiency. Of course, bureaucracy and efficiency will uh, impact the decision. Uh, and in our case, it's also about the personal precarity, because imagine that all those people, they got this uh, you know, this short term uh, contract and they knew that on this day they stopped their job, you know, and and 
here we need to finish because this is it. We don't have any budget after. And it was quite funny because when we were asking, uh, do you think that there will be an appeal of the decision? So the answer was, of course, it was budgeted. <laughs> you know, it was not even a question of. Uh, so uh, or another example was that the decision was given like uh, um, uh, the decision was given, uh, uh, I don't remember now exactly the date, but it was only a resume, like 20 pages, and the 300 decision was rendered after the date that uh, uh, was uh, decided to put appeals. Uh, so, um, of course, there was a problem because the, the defense lawyer could not uh, deposit their appeal uh, with the, the entire decision. And this is, again, this is an institutional factor depending on the budget uh, and also the, the constraint of, of having such a huge amount of, of bureaucratic work to do. You know, the defense lawyer, when he was appointed, uh, he was, he told us, you know, I got in a, a USB key uh, uh, 45,000 pages to read in three months. And he told us, and I didn't know even how to open the, the, the USB key, you know, <laughs> so all this issue. And lastly, we have the question of the interaction with politics. And here, uh, uh, because always when we judge this kind of question, it's always on the frontier of politicized justice. And what is interesting to see is two things. It's why the law claim, it's uh, capacity to evade the political variable. Uh, we are, want to show the position that is given in the courtroom to politics and international relation. This is one thing. Then how the facts are established with which political be, uh, uh, and, uh, background. And, and lastly, what is the political role itself of the court? Well, so these are the three questions uh, uh, to look. So um, this is what I wanted to do within my presentation. So I hope it was interesting for you. I will just uh, close my, voila, partage the voila. Yes, so back to you, please. <laughs> Super. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. That was fascinating. And a couple of people had to go, unfortunately, on to other things, but they've, they've said how interesting they found it in the comments. Um, and I think Vanilla is suffering a connection problem. All this just reinforces your point at the start about how much uh, nicer it would be to do it in person. So hopefully <laughs> at some point we can, but um, there are still a few people present who, who may have some questions. So. If you do, pop your hand up digitally or type something into the bar. I'm happy to read out anything you might want to ask. Um, Bryce, you, you're first in. Um, thank you, Connor, and um, thank you, Sharon, very much. That was a fascinating presentation, and I, I look forward to reading the book and the article. Could you say something about the way the research you conducted was funded and oh. how much how much money was good, involved good in question. it? <laughs> Thank you for a question. This is a, a very good question. It's true that I, I usually don't speak about this because, you know, it was so low budget, you know, and this is what is great because I know that now many academics are all the time concerned about having the one million to their university in order to do research that probably you don't need more than, I don't know, you know, 5,000. Uh, so what we did uh, is that, okay, so the, the, let's say that the first uh, um, money that uh, we applied for was a Berkeley Fa uh, France Foundation. Okay, this is when I was in Berkeley. Uh, so this was a uh, $15,000 grant. Okay, and we applied to this and we said, let's apply to this. And if it works, we will go with students. You see, this is how we started. We started, we will go as a, as a project for students. We never imagined to have a book, uh, you know, in Oxford and etc. <laughs> so uh, we started the trip with this uh, 50,000. This 50,000 uh, uh, was for us to go to the car. Uh, to Kim to arrive to France before and to organize the workshop because you know to organize the workshop we were in Paris many actors were in Paris uh, we just bought some uh, a coffee and you know so it was not a big uh, conference uh, money did, issue did you, did you say 50 or 15? 15, one fifth, one 15. Five. this right. was the initial money okay uh, uh, for to go to this 
Then uh, we apply to another 10,000 from another uh, foundation that we found in the U.S. Uh, and then at the end, we applied money for translation because most of the people were uh, writing in uh, French. So we got another 5,000 from my university, uh, the American University of Paris, to do the translation. And perhaps another sum from Open Society, I don't remember. But let's say it was perhaps 15, uh, around 30,000 euros, something like this. You see, so it was really low budget. <laughs> it, it, every time that we needed money, we just applied. But really, when we didn't, we needed the money, you know. <laughs> and, and students work a lot, and we, we did a very collaborative uh, work, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you very much indeed, that's fascinating. Thank you, Bryce. I'm, I'm annoyed with myself for letting you ask your question first, <laughs> because my, my, my reflection question was going to be similar. Actually, I was going to say, I was struck by how, and Claire, I see your hand, by the way, just um, popping in, taking chairs of the bandage here. I was going to say how I was struck by the institutional factors. You, you kind of flagged up about the court. I thought actually apply quite a lot to a researcher's um, abilities to conduct research. You were talking about budget, time, access, and all those things made me wonder, how did you find the time and the money and and yeah. get the access and and then moving on from that how transferable was this because you seem to have been really lucky to get all the access you needed and all these willing participants and so i wondered about how transferable is it practically but also how do you choose something significant enough but also manageable enough to to do something like this with the game um and I'm interested because you know I know you've, you've you've spoken about moving into Colombia and doing something similar there, so yeah, any yeah, great. Prices to some of that out, but if you've anything else to add, it'd be interesting. No, no, so it's a great follow-up question because before we spoke about the money, uh, and now we sp you actually speak about access, which is a very important question, right? Uh, so in this specific. Uh, case uh so my collabor i mean i was at berkeley at that time and then i met someone from the human rights uh, center who present me presented me to kim and kim she was the co-editor at that time they submitted an amicus, amicus courier to the, this court on sexual violence so in a way she knew a lot of people from within the court okay and then the third the researcher is Shirstin. She did her PhD uh, at her postdoc uh, on the Habra case. She, she came from I Court in Denmark. She was at that time working on the Habra. So she already had already many people that she knew from different interviews that she did. So in a way, we all brought our, uh, let's say, network of connections, okay? Uh, or from being a pure researcher as Shirstin, or being an actor like him. And also, I myself had quite a large of network uh, from being in Geneva before. So you have the, the RCRC and different NGOs, people that I knew from before. So in a way, uh, the, the essence was that we are researchers, but in a way, to a certain extent, also practitioners, or at least some of us, you know. And then it opened this uh, network of contact. Um, and this is a, the way that I o always uh, was doing myself, also when I st studied Guantanamo or now when I'm studying uh, at the tourism court. You know, sometimes it's enough to have one person that you feel trust and you discuss with him, and this person will open you to the door and will introduce you to people. And then, yes, yes, it takes time, of course, <laughs> but this is the work. You don't uh, necessarily need to read uh, 100 books, but you are there and you try to enter those places and believe me if you try you success because people like to speak about their job <laughs> and they're only waiting that someone will ask them what they are doing you know <laughs> uh yeah so it takes time uh and then i think it's a bit of your personality that you need to be curious and you need to uh you know not to be shy and etc uh, but uh, well, this is at least how we made it. Uh, so it was thanks to each one of us uh, connection and networks. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, Claire, you want to jump in as well? Hi, I hope you can hear me. Okay. Um, Sharon, that was really interesting. It was really, really interesting to hear about all your work. Congratulations on that. We met a few years ago. You might not remember me in Cardiff. 
um, an event organised by Saha. I was presenting random work on the Andean region in states of emergency. Absolutely, so I'm the same great absolutely. person. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> and I wanted to congratulate you again on your ethnographic and sociological approach to looking at courts. And I, again, I wanted to talk about methodology, I suppose, and the interviews. And I wanted to ask, obviously, these are high stakes trials. And you might expect to find some contradictions between accounts, you know, all these actors talking to you in the first part of the book. And I wanted to ask, how do you deal with any contradictions in these accounts? Because people sometimes try and overstate their role or cover their backs, you know, in high insight. So did you find those sort of contradictions in accounts? And if so, what, what have you done with them? Yeah, really excellent question. Thank you so much. I, 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 really, I, I really like this issue of contradiction because I think that, uh, contradiction is the part of life, right? I mean, uh, nothing is linear and nothing is going uh, always as uh, something like this that is going more and more to better or whatever. And uh, um, we as person, we have contradiction and we do mistakes and we do th things that are not necessarily uh, going to our best interest. And, it's, and then you can see it uh, everywhere you will see human interaction. So of course there are contradiction. And for me, contradiction, it's not something that needs a solution. Uh, uh, for mm -hmm. me, contradiction is the way it's working. Uh, and then the result, it's a kind of a balance between those different forces, right? So perhaps it's not mm -hmm. really contradiction, but it's different forces, uh, simplement. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when we encounter those contradictions, so we are just, we just leave them there, right? It's like this mm -hmm. African court for African justice by African, I don't remember now exactly the term, but, and then we discover that it's a friend judge, right? So this is a contradiction, but you know, it's fine. This is how it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, we have many, so if you read the chapter of the defense lawyer, there you will see a lot of mm -hmm. criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, so uh, I never try to solve contradiction. I think it's a part mm -hmm. of how things are being done. Uh, and mm -hmm. then the, the, the way it will achieve is, is th this is also what I was saying about competition between groups, you know, maybe you call it a, mm -hmm. a, a, a contradiction. For me, it will be simply different groups with different in interests, different experiences, uh, and how the, the way the interaction will work, this it will produce this, or maybe it could produce that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But if you don't have any on dear any agenda from the beginning so you mm -hmm. don't necessarily yeah. have any contradiction either you know <laughs> because yeah. i'm not mm -hmm. there to fight impunity i'm not there to make sure that justice success you know i'm not yeah. there to mm -hmm. to be sure that everything is according to the rule of law in this sense yeah. i don't care you know i'm just there yeah. to look what happens yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. to report on this and to show this process uh work in this way and then what can we yeah. learn you know exactly and that's so the grounded theory is probably the, the best approach that you were saying in yes 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 and now with sarah that you mentioned we will start in september uh, in asylum court to do this yeah ah brilliant yeah ah excellent well many congratulations again it's fascinating and thank nice you to see so you. much thank you for your feedback <laughs> thank you claire um if anyone else has questions or comments before we wrap up um let us know I, I had one more, which was just about the publisher, Sharon. So mm -hmm. it's amazing that OUP have supported this, I think. And I just wondered, were they supported from the outset? Because you have, at the end of the day, a whole swathe of non-academic writers who, as you've said, I presume quite a number of them had to be translated. Mm -hmm. um, so w were there many challenges there or was that more straightforward than perhaps I'm thinking? OK, so these are two questions. So about the publisher. Uh, we had the publisher, uh, uh, okay, so as I told you, you, we did this workshop and then we went to Senegal a few times and then we have all this material and then we're thinking, what are we going to do, you know? <laughs> and then I already published a book with Oxford, so I had uh, kind of, um, my PhD at that time was published with Oxford, so I had the kind of a person there to discuss, you know? And then I, I and then when we decided that we will have this idea of the two parts and da -da, then reward the proposition to Oxford. So uh, 
at quite early stages we had this. I mean, after the interviews, but then we prepared the the proposal and and, and then they accepted it. You know, uh, we had three reviewers and they were all positive uh, because mainly it was this idea of this new uh, methodology to, to reach this empirical um, this empirical data. You know, the insight from the court. Uh, so the 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 yeah the book proposal was there, let's say, um, quite early, then it took us a long time to make the book. I mean, it was huge. I don't know if you edited the book, but 43 authors. And of course, at the beginning, there were others that were supposed and didn't give. And wow, it was super hard. And some of the chapter, for example, the defense lawyer. So we made an interview, but he, we recorded the interview. At, at the end, we wrote the chapter based on the interview and we sent him so he will double check. You know, so it was not all easy. Huh? Uh, many, many people. Uh, uh, yeah, most of them write in French. And then you have the issue of translation. But also, those are people that are not used many times to books, you know, that are just people that work. For example, imagine the the donors or the one who work as administrators. So we needed really to send and resend maybe five times until we have a chapter. You know, it was like a crazy work. I, I don't know how we did it. I will never do it again, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it was like a magic and we were three and, you know, we divided the work. And uh, But it took us, I think, three years. Huh? It was very long, yeah. <laughs> it's an amazing accomplishment, it really is, just in terms of its scale, but also elevation, like we've said. Um, it's, it's excellent, and I suppose anybody who does want to do it again. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, be because we want to do it perhaps in Colombia, but let's see if it will happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, I'm, great. I'm glad the publishers trusted in you to do it, because I think if I was ever approached to you know, to, to be involved in something, I, I would feel far more comfortable writing up my own story than speaking about it and then leaving it to somebody else to interpret it. That you've more agency, don't you? So, um, I don't know. I think it's I think it's an excellent idea, and I'm just I'm glad you, you give us a bit of time to break it down and think yeah. about the practicality. So. It's so thanks very much. I just wanted just to add on something that you say, if I may, it's one minute and then we finish. It's true that we gave people to express themselves, right? But there is a lot of us because the way that we constructed the narrative of the chapters, the way that we edited the chapter, what we asked the author to write. So it's not really only bringing, uh, you see what I mean? So there is a very strong editing work, uh, uh, perhaps stronger than in usual editing book, right? So to construct this unified narrative through the chapter. Well, right. Totally, totally. Well, Sharon, that's time, I'm afraid. But yeah. um, thanks again for, for giving it to us and for being so generous with your your answers as well. Um, I hope the next project goes just as well for you. And <laughs> Thank you. if you are ever in Belfast, you have a bunch of people who would be happy to host you and, and take you for lunch. So. Thank um, you so much. Relationships are everything, aren't they, as you said earlier? So. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. And you are all, if you are in Paris, uh, please send me an email. And it's a small world, so I'm, I'm sure we will meet somewhere sometime. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Okay. Well, Thank have a good day so anyway. And thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, bye for bye. <laughs> bye. Thanks.